Hi, Christian. Hello, Marshall. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. I'm glad that I get to interview you. Yeah, I'm very glad to be talking to you right now. And we're all decked out in our holiday outfits. I got this yesterday. I'm, uh, I was surprised that I was able to get this when I did. I uh, walked into H&M and they just happened to have this right in front. Oh, uh, well, I didn't have any sweaters that were like Christmas, so I just figured I'd find my brightest green and my brightest red and, and, uh, and compose. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's definitely festive. Yeah. And let's see, do you have a, a food or coffee or anything like that? Oh, wait, I've still got my pour over. Hey, but the pour over has the red on it. So, that's good. I have a red apple and a uh, glass of water. Oh, a red apple and a glass of water. I have a cup of coffee and an apple off of the tree in the backyard. <laughs> You are part of the Proco team. I am part of the Proco team, yeah. I want to introduce Christian Nee. I met Christian three years ago this week, actually. And I was teaching a class called, it was a, a seminar called How to Get Hired in the Arts at AI. And uh, he was there and he had questions for me. And we eventually went on some walks in my area here. And on one of those walks, I was expressing to him that I had an anatomy course in 2018, summer of 2018, that I needed a room for. I hadn't done it in many years. And within a matter of a week or two or three, Christian had a small comic book studio uh, Anomaly Studios, n walking distance from my house where we could do our anatomy course. They even recruited people into it. We even sold it out. It was a wonderful group in the summer of 2018 that after classes, we hung out and watched videos. And every time I came to that classroom, it was set up with the screen and the chairs and everything was set up. So, it was one of the few times that I did a freelance seminar where I didn't have to do anything because Christian did all the work. So, you can see he made an impression on me as a guy who made my life easier and uh, introduced me to people and we had lots of uh, conversations with people that you know because you know more people than anybody that I know, including old people. Uh, Christian is a connector and a, a, uh, a what, how do you define yourself, Christian? I don't know. I, I don't know how to define myself. You know, lately people have been describing me as somebody who is extroverted and a connector, but I, I honestly don't feel that way. Um, the way I would describe myself is more of just a, somebody who's curious about people. Like in the case of your anatomy class, it worked out very positively in your favor, but I also wanted to take your anatomy class and I got to do it with my friends and I got to take it for free. Um, and I didn't have to drive that far to do it. So, it ended up being a thing where I got to, you know, hang out with my friends and learn anatomy and not have to pay for it. Well, yeah, that's that's the irony of uh, helping someone else and getting a benefit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're a networker. People have been describing me as a connector and um, I don't know if I disagree with it, but it's not necessarily my intention. You know, it's it's more of just a, like a genuine curiosity in, in people. You know, everyone mm -hmm. that I've met, like I, I know people at um, more studios that I could probably get jobs at than I could count. And it wasn't necessarily me wanting to go and meet cool, like people at Cartoon Network or Blizzard or Riot or EA or, you know, Warner Brothers or wherever else. And it was never about me wanting to um, meet those people to have a connection with them to further my career was more just about trying to, you know, just meeting people. And then eventually, like over time, it's turned into this network of people that I can call upon and just ask advice for or ask for help. And it's, it's strange that I'm very like publicly being recognized as somebody who knows a lot of people because I, I, I don't see it that way generally. Well, you were raised around the comic book industry and around the game industry. Yeah. yeah. And so, you took it for granted, right? I mean, you were as far back as you can remember. This was this was life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. It's uh, it's 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 definitely strange. I, I was raised in the entertainment industry. I, I've been around the, the stuff for as long as I can remember. It's less so that I'm. I I think I'm privileged by getting to have dinners with important people. I think it's more so that I'm used to talking to people that might otherwise intimidate me. 
you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, people that are way further ahead in their careers than I am at that point when talking to them. But like the ability to talk to them as an, an actual person instead of somebody that can further my career or, or you know, give, give me something in return. Yeah. In some ways, it's not much different from talking with the uh, former babysitter, right? I mean, this is uh, from childhood. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what, what are you doing these days? I want to hear about what Christian is up to. I just got back from a, a trip from New York City to Syracuse. Um, my friends and I, we rode our bikes from New York City with the, with the intention of trying to go to Niagara Falls. I see. So, so the initial trip was, you know, we were planning on cycling, riding our bikes about 80 miles a day to Niagara Falls, but we only made it to Syracuse. Was Syracuse a good long ride? How long was it? The ride to Syracuse was about 300 miles. How long is it to Niagara Falls? Uh, 500. And those, those of you who are into math, they made it three-fifths of the way to Niagara Falls. Not bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not bad. Okay. So, you did a bike ride with how many people? Initially, four of us. Uh, two of the guys that joined initially, they, you know, they had work on Monday and all that kind of stuff. So, they couldn't join for the entire time. But then another friend of mine, uh, Eric, he... Uh, came for the entire thing. And it took about six days to get from New York City to Syracuse. Is this the longest trip you've done on your bike? So far, yeah. The hope is to do something really big someday, you know, like ride my bike across the United States or across mm -hmm. Europe or something. Now, there's got to be a motive behind this. This was to get you out and doing something? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I think uh, that the world is a lot bigger than we initially think it is. You know, it's it's like when people are caught up in their day-to-day -day lives, it's really easy to get into a rut. You know, it's um, like, I don't know, like even a couple miles from where I'm living right now, I find things all the time that I, I am completely blown away by and I'm completely surprised by. Like when I was doing that road trip across the United States, I ended up passing a lot of things that I wish I had stopped for. But, you know, whether there was no place to park or it was you know, I just was being lazy or something, you know, but on a bike, you're only going like 12 miles per hour. So, you know, if you want to stop, you, you can stop and, you know, you, you end up uh, discovering things and meeting people that, you know, you never would have discovered otherwise. My tires exploded on like the fourth day of the trip or something. And uh, we sat outside on the side of the road for about an hour and a half, just trying to get, you know, we just trying to fix them. And then, Eventually, this guy named Larry, he came outside of his house and he, um, he spent like two and a half hours just trying to help us. And then eventually when we decided that the bike was unsalvageable, he drove us, you know, 30 minutes away to a bike shop in town. Wow. It's hard to be cynical about people when you are on those kind of adventures and that kind of stuff happens. My subconscious opinion of rural New York might have been people I might have not gotten along with. You know, but it ended up being a great, you know, good complete strangers were stopping on the side, on the side of the road to help us. So community on this continent of with strangers. Yeah, yeah. Now that was on your bike trip. Yeah, yeah, it was. When you were on your road trip with the car for a whole summer, what was that? Summer of twenty eighteen? No, twenty nineteen. July last year, yeah. Or May I don't I can't I can't remember what month. How long did it last? Uh two months. So two months traveling. Yeah. And uh, did you stay in hotels? Did you stay with people? What, how'd that work? Um, so, I, I did a mix of sleeping in my car in Walmart parking lots and um, sleeping at uh, Airbnbs and then with family randomly and, uh, uh -huh. you know, and, and staying with friends as well. And I don't know, it, it was another one of those cases of, you know, when you're, when you're actually out and you need help, you know, people will stop and they will actually genuinely be interested in helping you. I've made friends on that trip that we will continue to be friends uh, well into the future. And um, it, it was one of the, like, I, I did it on a budget in a 2004 Toyota Camry. And I think if I were to have done it where I was staying at fancy hotels and staying in a really fancy RV or something, it would have detracted from the overall experience because I'd be too, too protected. It's like um, people w wouldn't need to help me, so they wouldn't, you know. Mm -hmm. I remember I was sleeping in the back of my Camry in the middle of Tennessee in a parking lot, in, in, in a Walmart parking lot. And I was scrunched up, you know, I'm, I'm 6'1", and the back of a Camry is, you know, it's like this 
this far, you know, it, it's it's about four, or five feet across yeah, or something. I, I've seen pictures. I know you. Know, it doesn't. It doesn't really hold you comfortably. I remember sitting in the back of that Camry in the middle of Tennessee. It was raining badly, and I remember thinking, "This is like, I, there's no place I would rather be, you know, than sitting in the back of this Camry in the middle of Tennessee, in the in, you know, hundreds of miles from people that I know. You know, it's and thinking like like this is probably you know one of the happiest. And most content I've been in a, in a really long time. Well, that's great. And you're, what we're hearing is the positive side of this, and it resonates with your optimism about people and your hope that this could be a good thing. This could be a good thing, which I admire and forgive my parental energy that says, "Yeah, but that's dangerous." Well, well it, it, it is dangerous to an extent, right? Like. Not like bad stuff does happen on those kind of trips, but not not really. It, it's pretty rare, and I, I guess people would be surprised with how far you could get. Like I've never hitchhiked, but I would like to try and hitchhike at some point. Before you hitchhike, maybe we should sit you down with somebody that I know who used to hitchhike a lot and hear some stories. <laughs> maybe I'm glad yeah. that it went without incident. Yeah, I am glad that you sent me pictures. I'm glad that I got through about three quarters of your journey, including museum trips and seeing inside NCY studios and seeing what did you send me? The Smithsonian, the Met, yeah. every every place you went, I was getting to see what you were doing. And again, it gave me the sense of vicarious travel. Oh yeah, well here, here, here wait. Um, I think I went. To, I actually have the uh, sketchbook. I, I went to uh, like sixty museums or something, and I have the wow. Oh, you sure uh, do. Yeah, yeah. All the okay, but uh, yeah, no, it, it's I don't, I don't know. It's um, like the reason I met you is uh, I was taking classes with Aaron O'Shea at Saddleback College, and Mike Sheehan, and um, Phil Dimitriotis, and uh, I would intern at Game Studios, and all of these people would say really positive things about you, and. You know, it's like across the board, I would go to all these random places and independently of everybody else, they would all say positive things about Marshall Vandruff. Mm -hmm. And it made me curious enough to go out and try and, and actually attend your art institute. Yeah. Because of that, it it's become this thing where I, I consider you a really good friend and now we're, you know, having a very public conversation uh, on, on the Draftsman podcast. And, yeah. you know, I, like, like the point of that is like, if I was skeptical of going out and trying to approach a stranger, then none of this stuff would have ever happened, right? Yeah. And that's how I feel about those trips is like, you know, um, I, you know, I spent about five months in England and that internship, you know, I, I guess uh, the guy that brought me there, he's, he's a friend of my father's, but um, I, on the trip, I, I like bugged him to go and get lunch with me and he inv ended up inviting me and taking me to, and sponsored me to Cambridge and, and let me uh, intern at his company and live there for free. And, mm -hmm. you know, if I was skeptical of going out and going on that kind of adventure and approaching people like that, then none of those uh, opportunities would have actually ever happened. Mm -hmm. The point of all these trips is like, you know, when you open yourself up to not being cynical about people and like try and stray away from the fear, then uh, I think that actually that that that's the thing that probably makes me good at networking okay so let me let me uh let me get my head around this you are a networker and uh you meet people like nobody i've ever known you you are uh one of the most effective networkers that i know and i sense that a lack of fear and the willingness to just ask people is part of it uh you do get rejected though right Oh yeah, absolutely, all the time, and it it, it sucks too. <laughs> like, like it doesn't feel great, but just part of being a person, you know. It's you can't be successful all the time. You know, if you go through your life trying to hit home runs every day, you're not gonna, you know, you're you're not gonna want to get out of bed. Okay, but you get an awful lot of people who say yes. Yeah. So there's got to be something with that too that you're getting people to say yes. How? Well, I I would say more than anything, it's genuine curiosity. You know, it's it's like I, I've sat down with at dinners with people and their, you know, that their net worth is in the tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. And, you know, we, I'm actually fascinated in how they got there. You know, it's like, what is 
different about them that has allowed them to become so successful so quickly? Um, like, like, well, what's different about them versus other people? Mm -hmm. And the thing that I found, it's, it's generally the, the lack of fear. You know, I, I was talking to one of my mentors and he was telling me, you know, it's as difficult to start a restaurant as it is to start um, like a, a company that's worth a hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. And it sounds ridiculous when you say it, but it's like to start a really, like to start a restaurant, you have to be there every single day. You have to clean the dishes. You have to make the food. You have to, you know, serve people. You have to keep it clean. And, you know, you might be there for 12 hours a day. And um, if you want to start a really successful website, it's the same deal. You know, you have to, you know, it's it just depending on the scale that you want to operate at. The thing that I found is that most people actually really want to help you. And most successful people don't actually have people knocking on their door, uh, having people ask them and actually be curious, you know. Uh, something that I found is that a lot of people just want to like bask in the glow. Like they actually don't want to ask them questions. They just want to like be around that person because it makes them feel cool or something, you know. Okay, I want to develop that, but I want to back up a little bit too. The thing about starting a hundred million dollar company uh, versus starting a restaurant and how you work just as hard. Yeah, I I was aware of that. I've been around. Uh, I was around a couple that started a restaurant, and I could not believe how every every minute of every day, and then it didn't make any difference. You were always behind. And there's two noir films I like: The Killers and The Killing. And both of them, the criminals have the justification that they can put you away just as long for a $10 heist as if you go for a million dollars. Uh, so, sorry to use the analogy of a criminal heist, but the idea is that if you if you are setting out to do something, uh, it might as well be something you really want to do that is close to you and that can reward you a lot. There is something in that worth pondering. Yeah, absolutely. A person who's got a $100 million a year business that you want, you're genuinely curious about them. I don't necessarily see that as something that's going to attract them. Everybody's curious about people who are very successful and the curiosity of the people they deem the outsiders can be obnoxious, that they feel stalked, that they feel, uh, I wish that people, I wish I was not known. And so, you're getting beyond that with something apart from curiosity. That's what I'm digging for here. Well, I, I think it's like the genuine curiosity is stronger than the pain of being embarrassed. And what I mean by that is that I'm willing to do things that like I'm willing to work for free to be around people. Mm -hmm. When somebody asks you to do something, when somebody, when you ask somebody advice and they tell you to read a book, you should go and read that book that day. You know, it's like if, if you were having lunch with Warren Buffett, I guarantee you he would recommend that you read the, the Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. If you have dinner with Warren Buffett and he tells you to do, do that and you don't do it, then he's going to be like, this guy's not serious. Mm -hmm. He says he's interested, but not really based on his, on his actual actions. Yeah. I mean, it might be a negative side of teaching is like when you go and you pour your heart out to a class and you tell people like, oh, you, you have to study these artists, you have to do these things in order to become successful. And then they don't do it and they go and play video games instead. I'm sure that that's like a frustrating thing for you. You know, it, it doesn't make you want to give that person more attention. But when they reciprocate it, it's like, you know, that person read the book that I asked them to read and they actually did it, you know, and now we can talk about it and now we can move forward. Yeah, there is something about that the shared interests uh, bring people together. And if someone's coming to someone, then they share their interests and it's like, okay, yeah, I, I get excited about this too. But people whose time is extremely valuable that you will volunteer to, uh, you will request to be part of their schedule, that that's one way of showing respect is that they yeah. see that you are a potential apprentice, a person who's worth giving time to. You know, like when people say they want to be a rock star, mm -hmm. they say that, but they're not willing to learn chords. You know, in the same way that when people say they want to be a professional artist, you know, they want to do concept art, but they don't want to learn how to shade a sphere, you know, really, or they don't want to learn anatomy or perspective or any of that kind of stuff. You know, when, when that happens, I think it's more so that like that person, they don't care about doing art enough professionally to not have fun, you know, to, to be bored. 
like, like to, to become a professional artist or a professional musician, like for a musician, you have to learn your scales, right? Or for becoming an artist, you have to, um, you have to learn anatomy, perspective, uh, how to shade a sphere, things that are actually very boring to learn. But it's, it's almost like they, people who, you know, say they want to be an artist, but don't learn that stuff. It's like they hate being bored more than they like the idea of being an artist. They're not willing to pay the price, you mean? Yeah, 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 exactly. And, you know, it, it's like I was, like, if you want to be a stand-up comedian, right? Like, you have to go and bomb in front of hundreds of people, you know? And every, you know, I, 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 I'm sure if you ask a, any stand-up comedian, um, if they bombed, you know, any, any of the really famous ones too, Conan O'Brien or Jimmy Kimmel or any of those guys, they would all say that they've bombed in front of people, you know? And it, I think it's more just about kind of uh, paying your dues and, you know, you, you kind of just have to, you know, you, you kind of have to do that in order to like play the game. Now, you knew this from an early age. Yeah, yeah. My father has been very successful in entertainment and as a result, I've been around a lot of successful people in, in entertainment. And, you know, it, it's, it's a strange thing because a lot of these people that are successful in entertainment, they're often uh, rags to riches kind of people. They started very poor. They came from middle class or lower class incomes. And the only thing that separated them from the people that ended up becoming incredibly successful, you know, it's hard work. But that's, that's the great separator. You know, it's how many hours they actually put into it. Yeah. You know, it's like a hard work beats nepotism any day. Uh, what happened when you were 18? Or were you, did you want to be an artist when you were a teenager? Yeah, yeah. Well, so I, I guess the way I got into art is that I, uh, I was one of those kids who wanted to be a concept artist at Blizzard. You know, I wanted to go and do draw orcs and... I wanted to work on World of Warcraft. And um, so, you know, around seven, like between 17 and 19, I started taking art really pretty seriously. Mm -hmm. I ended up going and interning for a video game company called uh, Digital Funk Machine for about a year while uh, in community college. And, it, you know, it was, it was like a day a week or a couple of days a week and just to get an idea of what it was actually like. And, you know, I was working for free, just, you know, just getting an idea of what it's actually like to be in one of those studios. And, um, you know, from there, I, I ended up going and working for free for a little while for an artist, uh, Brian Haberlin. At Anomaly Studios? Yeah, yeah, at Anomaly Studios and eventually hired me. I guess uh, from there, I eventually started working for Stan. I also offered to work for him for free and then eventually he started paying me as well. Tell me about that. Everybody here knows about Proko yeah. and you're on the Proko team. You've even been zombified, haven't you? I have been zombified. You were too, actually. You were a couple times. I didn't know I was zombified, but now I guess I know. Okay, but you were zombified and you sent me a picture of your zombification, which uh, made me wince a little bit. Uh, but that's because what what do you do for the Proco team? Tell me your role. I, I guess my goal right now is like instructor outreach. Like I, I introduced uh, Scott Flanders to Stan, uh, inter introduced uh, Taylor Olivas to Stan. Great. Who, he recently had a video up there as well, uh, Steven Zapata. You know, I, I guess my role is more introducing people to Stan. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, so Stan, who uh, who knows how to run a business, sees this guy. This guy knows everybody. I can put him to use for that. So he he exploited you. He had you work for him for free. I offered actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I remember you telling me. Uh, I asked you right if he if I could work for him and for for free, and he's like, yeah. I, he totally can, but I, you know, I, I would have paid him first. But you know, I, I ended up, you know, I, I I have access to nepotism, and to me, the idea of working for Stan for free was more interesting than going and working at a AAA studio or you know Warner Brothers or any of those places. Mm -hmm. Entering one at one of those studios at at a very junior level, you're not going to actually really learn that much. You know, you're going to usually be put to grunt work and you know generally when working for a much smaller company you have the ability to interface with the people who actually own the business a lot faster and a lot more directly than you would other like you know if you're interning at warner brothers you don't get to interact with the people who own warner brothers right right okay i got you to separate yourself from everyone else trying to climb the corporate ladder you're going to have to work really 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 hard it's not an argument against working for a big company uh, because if you get your foot in the door, you you do meet people. But the, 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 uh, that, that is a good point, that the smaller the company, the more likely you are to have an influence on the company. 
and the more likely you are to be connecting with the formation of it. And and like what you're doing with Stan is you're introducing artists to Stan. That's great. Yeah, yeah. And I I don't know. It's it, it's like a I, I feel like I actually have a more genuine impact on Proco than I would otherwise if I were at a you know a massive company. Well, now that people are watching this and artists who want to be involved with Stan, they know to contact you and leave Stan alone because he's got a new baby. And so, Christian is the guy. My, my email is uh, Christian with a K, K-R-I-S-T-I-A-N at Proco.com. <laughs> Here we are, the recruiter of talent for Stan. Now, you've got to deal with people who want you, want your time and that you will recommend books. I, I have a book list on my... I, I, I made a website for this podcast, actually. Okay. It's uh, christianne.com and I do actually have a book list on there. Um, that, that I, I would recommend everyone go and read all this book. Oh, Christian, you're turning from connector and networker to gatekeeper now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's strange. It's bizarre. Yeah. Now, you've got a role model. Tell us about that. Well, so, so one of my biggest role models, uh, his name is uh, Shep Gordon. And you probably don't know him by name, but you know the stuff that he's worked on. Um, he was Alice Cooper's manager. He started a couple of movie studios. Um, he gave uh, Ridley Scott his first movie. And you, you, you could go down the list of things that he's done that you probably know about. And uh, he has a documentary called Supermensch and a book uh, also called Supermensch, coincidentally. But um, <laughs> he, uh, he's built a career off the win-win scenario. You know, it's like every time he's had the opportunity to uh, work with somebody creative, he's always found a way to make sure that everybody involved somehow benefits, you know, that there are no losers. And I think that as a philosophy, a no loser scenario is, if you're looking at it from an efficiency point of view, it's a really, it, it's inefficient in the short term, but in the long term, people think more highly of you, you know, you, I guess, have more uh, social currency. The karma ends up coming back to you tenfold. You know, it, it's like me helping you with that uh, anatomy workshop, you know, you've helped me 10 times that by introducing me to Stan, uh, by inviting me onto this podcast and uh, introducing me to other people. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, I would say that, that it's a, it's a win-win scenario for, for both of us as well. Isn't it wonderful? I mean, yeah. when, when there, you've got people who are seeking, how can we make good happen for all and not with the, I've got to win and others must lose. I, I just want to spend the rest of my life uh, around that kind of energy. There's something that is, is just as exciting about it as can be. And I, uh, another thing that Christian did for me was that when I was teaching at CDA and teaching in just teaching in Los Angeles, it's a 60 to 80 mile drive from here and I don't like to drive. And Christian picked me up at my house, <laughs> drove from San Diego to Orange County, picked me up at my house, drove me to LA. We'd be in class together, uh, drove me back to my house. It was just really, really wonderful to do that. And in the process, we had uh, lots of conversations. And you know, one of the first pages of, in fact, I've got it here, just a second. One of the first pages, it is the first page of my 2018, August 2018 uh, sketchbook. Uh, the first page is notes and it's about uh, good politics. It's with Christian Nee in Burbank, California. Good politics. Good politics are honest, uh, aligned desires, agreement on what's fair, rewards for good, admonishment for bad, a meritocracy with high standards, no Cain and Abel, and holding up an ideal and measuring progress. I wrote that down. That was in response to our conversation about what are our ideal political environments, uh, having observed so many that are quite the opposite of that. Uh, and I've, I've read that thought over it many times through and that was something was forged in one of our uh, our hangouts together. Yeah. Yeah, Shep Gordon is sort of exemplifies that in your estimation. He is an ideal of how to get people working together for success in the music industry and other industries too, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Um yeah, he, he's exemplified, you know, the idea like he has a he has a house in Hawaii and he'll invite people to stay for months at a time, you know, and like people will come over expecting to stay for a couple of days and stay for two months, two or three months, you know, and Shep will be this like a non-judgmental 
friend, you know, like a true, a true actual friend, you know, like somebody who actually doesn't say no and helps people when they actually truly need it and doesn't expect anything in return. Yeah. You know, I, I, he, he's, he's deep into the Dalai Lama's teaching and mm -hmm. he believes deeply in karma and he's built his entire life around the idea that do something that's positive for other people. It will generally al always actually end up coming and coming back to you in, in ways that you'd never expect. There was something about Shep Gordon and the paparazzi that you told me about once. Yeah. Tell us about that. There's this wedding happening in Hawaii. Um, I forgot the, the specific celebrity, but um, the celebrity was getting married in Hawaii and he was having trouble with paparazzi, you know, following him around everywhere. And um, he didn't want his wedding to be swarmed with, you know, dozens or hundreds of people with cameras. And so, he contacted, you know, the celebrity who, who's friends with Shep contacted Shep and Shep contacted the, um, you know, like, like the, in the hierarchy of paparazzi, there was this one guy that, you know, is, is at the top and Shep contacted that guy and he, um, uh, he made an agreement with the paparazzi that, uh, he would call in the, the paparazzi head would call in favors to make sure, you know, no one went to that wedding to bother that celebrity. In exchange, the celebrity let him go and take a couple of photos. So, you know, so, so everybody was happy essentially. You know, the paparazzi got to keep a, you know, he got to take photos of the wedding. Um, and there were exclusive photos too that only he had. Um, and the celebrity got to, um, you know, he, he got to have a, a nice wedding, you know, he didn't, he didn't, he, he wasn't bothered. And, you know, the, the beautiful thing about that is, you know, a lot of people in entertainment and celebrities especially might look at paparazzi very poorly, <laughs> you know, that they, yeah. they might be uh, some of the most like on the bottom rung of people that they'd want to be around. N Nicole Kidman said that they make it so that your life is like living in a fishbowl. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it's like Shep refused to see that guy as somebody who, had less value than anybody else and still offered him a chance to, you know, to, to do the right thing essentially. And he did and it ended up being a very positive thing for everybody. And, you know, it's, it's like, you know, even when there are cases when it might seem justified to hurt somebody, you know, to damage somebody, um, it, there are, there are always ways of making it, you know, making something positive, like work out in a very positive way, you know. I could see how that the paparazzi thing could be a problem though. The guy who was at the top of the hierarchy is the one that he makes the agreement with, which means he's the one who gets the photograph, which means all the other ones were excluded by his request. Yeah. Did, how, I mean, this may be a more complicated story than, than I'm hearing, but was there anything addressing that? Well, it, it, it's, uh, it was covered briefly in his documentary. Um, mm -hmm. that, that's as far as the story goes as far as I know. My yeah. assumption is that he calls them favors and, you know, maybe they got photos, okay. you know, it's something, right? Or they, they all got right. a cut of the, you know, whatever. But, um, you know, I, I, I would be very surprised if there, if it was a case where that paparazzi had dominated the other yes. people. You know? I would be surprised too, because the whole energy there is how can we, how can everybody have a better situation than they did previous to making this agreement. There is an energy like that. And I did, you know, this was an example of one of the things that we watched after our anatomy classes, summer 2018. We, we watched the Shep Gordon uh, yeah, yeah. documentary as a group. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I don't know. It's, it's, it's definitely like a, I, I think that that kind of success, it's not luck necessarily. It's, um, following a certain path and eventually things just, you know, it's like a domino effect, you know. Yeah. Shep Gordon went to college for psychology and he, you know, uh, he went to go work at a, a children's correctional facility, was quickly thrown out for being a hippie. And then he went to LA and ended up at a motel where uh, Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix were staying. And just by, you know, coincidence, he went out and started talking to them and then that's how he became a music manager, you know. Yeah. Jimi but, Hendrix told him he should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he's Jewish. <laughs> and yeah. it was, you know, I, I, Which he did not take it as an insult at all. He figured, okay, this is how you cast me in the, in the role. Yeah, I, I think the story is, uh, 
he, he was smoking pot with Jimi Hendrix and uh, he asked, you know, what should I do? And he said, are you Jewish? And he said, yeah. And he said, you should be a lawyer or no, you, you should be a, a, a manager. Yeah, you should be a manager. A manager, right? yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, he said, okay. Yeah, yeah. And he, he, he said, okay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, eventually he met Alice Cooper. Alice Cooper was 17 years old and he was mm. 24 when they had met. And I, I think that's the age difference, but, you know, there they, they were, they were I, he might've been like 23, you, you know, but they were, Shep was older, Alice was younger and um, they were both nobodies. Yeah. I, I, even Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin weren't like R Mount Rushmore at that time. You know, they yeah. weren't the people that they are now. Yeah. You know, they, they came up from nothing. They just did crazy stuff and they, you know, they just eventually over time just through working really hard. You know, they, they tried for years before getting any traction and then eventually they did and now they're obviously Alice Cooper. And Yeah, yeah. When, when people reach legendary status like that, there's an assumption that they were born uh, into legendary status. And so, to hear the stories of how when they were 17 and 24 or whatever they were, yeah, they, yeah. the idea, as you said, nobody knew who they were and that their energy was, we're going to do something. We're going to do something that makes a difference. And uh, some of the things they did were questionable. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They were super questionable. They're inspiring the way ca the catch me if you can character uh, is, is that this is not what you would necessarily recommend, but when you tell the story uh, and if it you uh, if you tell the story knowing that it has a good ending, then it's easier to give license to those things that were say, let's not go this route. Let's not do this kind of thing. But yes, the, the, you liking Shep Gordon as a role model is an example of what we talked about in 2018 of holding a standard and measuring against the standard is that here's what, here's what the people that we want to be like. Here's what the people who are doing the thing before us, they've already gone down that path and they've made the path happen. We're trying to make a similar path happen or make, push the path farther or make a new path altogether. And so, we can learn from what they did, not by copying them, but by seeing. One of the things I saw with, with Shep is uh, determination that we can do this. Optimism. We can do yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and the idea of becoming a famous musician is actually impossible. You know, it's like, it's, a, it's pretty much impossible, right? <laughs> and it, it's like, everybody really has to be on the same page in order for something like that to actually work. You know, the yeah. amount of stress, the amount of work you have to do, the amount of money involved, you know, it's, mm -hmm. you know, most people know Alice Cooper, but they don't know the other members of the, of the, you know, guitarist, drummer, right. whatever else. Yeah. And the songwriters. Yeah, yeah, songwriters too. Because he didn't write his own songs. Yeah, he had he had those those songwriters that made had one guy in particular that made great yeah, yeah. stuff happen. Yeah, well, and you know, just sheer creativity too. Like, um, they would try the craziest stuff. Like their uh, "Schools Out" album. You remember around the actual disc, there were panties on the yeah, disc. I remember. And uh, that was Shep's idea. He's like, <laughs> you know, we're talking about it decades later, right? Mm -hmm. It obviously brings up like wow, that's so cool or that's, oh, that's disgusting or that's, you know, whatever else. And yeah. It stands out as a, a, as a thing to remember. Our emotional health is just as important to maintain as our physical health, yet some people choose to ignore it. If you're someone that's interested in going to therapy, consider my sponsor for this episode, BetterHelp. BetterHelp is unique because they take out the annoying aspects of going to therapy. Gone are the days of searching for a therapist in your local area and driving to their office. That's because everything is done through their smartphone app. You can schedule appointments at your leisure and sessions are conducted by secure video or over the phone. On top of that, you can chat and text with your BetterHelp therapist. It doesn't stop there though because BetterHelp also writes free articles that anyone can view on their website. Having additional written resources like BetterHelp to pull from can be really beneficial with your therapy sessions. Right now, BetterHelp is offering all Draftsman listeners 10% off your first month with discount code Draftsman. To get started, go to betterhelp.com slash Draftsman. Simply fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor you'll love. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Draftsman. 2021, online classes with me and one with Vance Kovacs. Go to martialart.com. 
you mentioned that it's impossible to become a famous musician and yet somebody said recently that why is pop music on repeat? And I didn't know that pop music was on repeat because I just don't hear pop music. But I have paid attention to the last hundred years or so of pop music and there's so obviously cycles where the same thing is getting done over and over and over and over and inevitably it is like water building up against a dam to break the dam. It takes enough tension to where someone has their finger on the pulse of why is it that so much stuff sucks when I can do better and then some young person has the audacity to do better and then everybody hears it and they say, wow, wow, that's different. We like that. That's good. And it, it, it turns around music history. And oh gosh, that was happening when I was eight, nine years, well, when I was uh, six, seven years old. And then again, when I was uh, uh, 10 and 11 years old with the, in the first part with the Beatles and the second part with Heavy Metal and Alice Cooper, Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin, all that stuff. That's why I recommend moguls and movie stars so much to have a, a 70 year sweep of how visual storytelling happened in the movie industry, in Hollywood in particular, since Hollywood dominated that industry. Watching that over and over with students, it is so inspiring to think that it's going to happen again. It's happening right now, happening with YouTube. It's it, uh, always happening, yeah. It's always happening. And so, who's making it happen? And as soon as a club of people say, we're making it happen, they may be wrong, but they may be right. I, I think it's a sign of uh, how amazing the times that we live in now are. It's like the taste and the way of getting yourself out there are changing all the time. And they're, you know, like I remember in that class I took with you at the Art Institute, you said that everybody has a, a TV channel in their pocket. They could upload anything they want onto YouTube. You know, millions of people can watch it if, if they want. Mm -hmm. It's pretty incredible. Like in the past, you had to be an artist who did the Saturday evening post covers in order to be famous, you know, but now you can post Instagram and, or post art station or post to YouTube or whatever. And, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of people can see it. Do you know the musician uh, Post Malone by chance? No, I don't, but tell me. He, he, he's, he's one of the most famous musicians right now. And, uh -huh. you know, he, he's, tw he's my age. He's 25 years old. Oh. And he, uh, <laughs> he got his start, you, you know, he, he, I forgot where he was living. He's, I think he's living somewhere in the Midwest. I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but um, he had a friend who was a famous Minecraft video game YouTuber and mm -hmm. he was moving to Los Angeles and Post Malone uh, moved with that Minecraft YouTuber to Los Angeles and slept like in a closet or something for mm -hmm. a year and a half or two years. And he just played music, you know, and eventually he released a song on the SoundCloud and it, it got like a billion downloads or something, like literally a billion downloads. And, wow. you know, he was this, this, just this 19, you know, 19, 20, 21 year old kid that just put something up on the SoundCloud and it exploded, you know? And, you know, he was just sitting, hanging out with his friends and I'm a big fan of Post Malone for that. You know, it's, it's uh, just the idea of being so interested in music that you're willing to sleep in on a couch for years or sleep in a closet and do everything in your power to make it work with the faith that it'll actually work. And then it, it and then it does, you know. Yeah. It's, yeah. Alice Cooper yeah. did that too. When he was Vince Fernier, I think was his original name. He talked about sleeping in theaters uh, so that he would have a place where it was dark. No, oh, <laughs> yeah, then, yeah. Yeah. It, uh, they're, they're sacrificial lifestyles before they're decadently indulgent lifestyles. Right. Uh, well, Christian, you seem to me like the person who is playing the role of an impresario, of a manager, of a person who's bringing people together to make good things happen and that is a role you want. Is that right? I think so, yeah. Well, so, I, I said before, you know, I, was, I, was, I wanted to be an artist and I wanted to go, I went to the Watts Atelier for a couple of years, trained with Eric Gist and Jeff Watts and Ben Young and all those guys and I really enjoyed it but then I kind of... You know, my dad did things in order to show me the realities of working. You know, I was a naive, optimistic young kid. And I don't know, I, he showed me kind of the realities of what it's like to actually be in a studio. Tell us more. Uh, he would sit me down with people that were very successful in their careers. You know, people that were art directors on like Diablo 3 or, you know, 
worked at EA for 30 years and they're game directors, you know, or people who run successful game studios and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it's, it's fun work and everything, but there, you also have to work incredibly hard and you don't have that much time off and you don't get paid that as much as you should. You know, I, I think game developers can get paid pretty well, but for 12 hours a day, it's often, in my opinion, it's not worth it. That's right. You've had you've had restaurant meetings with people who make much more and work and work less. Way way less. You know, yeah. it's not to say that that stuff isn't worth it. And it, you know, I, I think people that are interested in that kind of stuff should still pursue it. But for me, I'm realizing that um, I like people a lot more than I like art generally. You know, it's like the reason I really liked art. I realized is because it would allow me to be around people that were creative. Wow. You know, people that just wanted to sit around and talk about doing stuff. My goal is to make something bigger or contribute to something bigger than a single artist ever could be, whether it be with Proco or doing something else on my own or whatever else. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure or a combination of both. Mm -hmm. Like I, I'm constantly surprised that people I admire don't know each other. And there's so much opportunity for things to be created just by more people being more well connected that a single email or something might end up making something that would have been like 50% as, as cool as it could have been to like 300% cooler than it would have been. Mm -hmm. I, I met Scott Flanders at the uh, Watts Atelier boot camp with Tyler Jacobson in 2018 or 17 or something. And um, he was working at Riot Games at the time and he really wanted to break off and go do his own thing, but he didn't really know how. And um. Stan had done pretty much exactly what he wanted to do. So I introduced Stan to Scott and now Scott is actually doing it. You know, he's doing the thing that, that seems so scary when, it, when he was at Riot. Mm -hmm. Stan benefits because he gets to have Scott, who, who's, in a, who's a great teacher and artist, create content for his channel. And Scott gets to win because he um, gets to get Stan's advice and take advantage of his platform. Yeah. And, 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 and I'm not diminishing the value of people who work in games. I think I, I love playing video games. I think that that kind of work, I really admire it. It's just not for me. But, but you, you found this out by, by experience with people who were really in the world of it. It wasn't the glamorized version. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would be, I'd be sitting with, uh, you know, people that I really admired, you know, and they would uh, be c complaining about their, no, no, I shouldn't say complaining, but they'd, they'd have gripes about their jobs that I was like, wow, that's surprising. You know, it's a, it's a yeah. kind of a bummer, you know. Yeah. When you first came to me, you, that was one of the main themes that I remember yeah. is that you were, you were 23 years old. Is that right? 22, maybe? 22 years old and you were, you were aware of the lack of glamorousness right. of this industry. I, uh, I really love drawing and painting and I felt that the only way to be able to draw and paint all day as, was if I was a professional artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, guess, I guess it's like as I'm getting older, I'm realizing that you know, if you want to draw and paint, you should just go and draw and paint. Uh, it, what it means is that you can have a job that supports your art so that your art can be whatever you want it to be. It does not have to be for a studio. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's exactly it. Do you like the logistics of projects? I'm, I'm not very detail-oriented, to be completely honest. You know, it's, that, that, that's probably my biggest flaw as an individual. Well, you may be a CEO. I'm told that some of the most successful are not detail-oriented because they only see the big picture and they make the great big strategies and that's how they get the big bucks. Yeah, I mean, maybe. I don't know. I, 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 I don't know if I'm consistent enough to be a CEO. Well, we'll see. Christian, I'm interested uh, and hopeful that uh, since this is the end of 2020, uh, that when we look back years from now, uh, that we'll see that it's going to take turns that we didn't expect, but I'm hoping for really good things out of it because there have been really good things up to this point. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm um, more optimistic about the future than I've ever been in my entire life. I have uh, a lot of people to thank for that and I, I, I think the future looks very bright. Well, I'm glad you feel that way at a quarter of a century old.
Okay, what else do you want to talk about, Christian? Do you have any crazy questions? Because this is the only thing that you are famous for. No, two things you're famous for on the Proco, uh, in, in the Proco world. Well, maybe three now that you've been zombified. But the first one was Christian's Crazy Questions. That was the debut of your voice to the world where you asked a crazy question. It was about getting punched in the stomach or something like that, if you could only. I can't remember. Yeah. And, and then the second thing was that Stan has mentioned you twice as one of the best networkers that he knows. And uh, he initiated it. And now that you've been zombified, now, let's go back to the original thing. Bring a little full circle here. I want to hear about uh, any this crazy questions thing. Tell us the history of it. Well, I, I guess my entire life, I've always asked bizarre, strange questions. They, 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 they're not bizarre and strange to me. I'm generally actually pretty curious about the questions. But um, yeah, as long as I can remember, I would just... I would. Uh, Put down what I'm doing when I had a thought and just ask people what their opinion was on something. Like, I remember we were sitting at a, a class here at the anatomy workshop at Anomaly Studios and I asked you, um, do you prefer smooth or crunchy peanut butter? And you said, you prefer crunchy because you're not weak. I said that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you said that. Does it make any difference that I eat both kinds? And no. I guess I guess not, but you know, like if if you had to make a distinction between, you know, uh, one or the other, you you told me that uh, crunchy peanut butter was was much more superior to smooth. But but I but I slammed people who like creamy peanut butter, and yeah, I, I yeah, shouldn't have done that. I, yeah, 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 maybe I don't know. Yeah, you you answered it like somebody who was uh, trying to get the conversation about smooth. You're you're, you're trying to to create a divide. Between people who are potentially, yeah, I yeah, was a provocateur to, about yeah, yeah, which yeah, kind yeah, of, yeah, yeah. yeah see, there's the star yeah. bellied or the star off sneeches. Right. Yeah, I was probably doing that because it was just getting a little, little too agreeable in there. Well, I, I remember I was at the Proco Studio and I asked Stan. I, I we were playing a, the, the game Duroc, the card game, and I mm -hmm. asked. I, I think I asked, "Would you rather have a million dollars or a cup of coffee that never runs out of coffee?" And we spent the next two hours talking about how the cup of coffee that never runs out of coffee is obviously the right decision because you can pour the coffee out and it'll never stop. So, you can sell the coffee for far more than a million dollars. And the cup of coffee itself, you could probably sell it for the, in, in the billions for the technology that it, or the magic or whatever. Um, and then we started having a conversation about how, how long it would take for that cup of coffee to flood the entire planet with coffee. It, it was, it, you know, it, it was this entire thing. Yeah, entire. I'm not on board with it anyway. I'm not on board with it because first of all, I take the million dollars because the coffee thing means you have to start a business. Also, you got an ever ending cup of coffee. We're talking about a local area. You can't use this for the whole world because only people around and then you're in the business of having to collect the money and account for it all. You were talking earlier about starting a restaurant, starting a place that is just an endless flow of coffee is going to be a huge amount of responsibility. I'll take the million dollars. Thank you. Well, and, and, yeah, that, 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 that's also a good point. The amount of logistical things that like, is it FDA approved coffee? You know, can you sell that much coffee? Like, it might be we, bad I, coffee. It might be bad coffee. Well, I, I think we did the math and I think, you know, like a standard cup, right? It pours out, it pours out coffee uh, faster than all of Starbucks, right? Like, like all the all, planetary- All of Starbucks. Like all the whole of Starbucks. Worldwide, yeah. yeah it, like if, like it's pouring out enough coffee to out coffee Starbucks, right? Um, you know, I, I'm sure that, you know, people would want to steal it from you. Yeah. You know, you, they, they'd be curious about how you came across such yeah. a strange cup of coffee. When do I get my million dollars? <laughs> you're, I, I, you're I don't this know. this option. It's, yeah, yeah. It's a... Now, do you ask these questions in order to get at people's values or is this just a provo provocation? Partially. You know, a, a question I ask a lot of people is, uh, what would you do if you had a billion dollars? Right, and it sounds like a silly question, mm -hmm. but it, it it it's actually the goal of it is to get people to think about what would they do if they didn't have to worry about money. Yeah, and you what know? would you do? I would do exactly what I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. um, even if like I and I mean that completely truthfully, you know, I really, you know, um, maybe I would, I would like go and buy a you know like a really nice Ferrari or something. I, I actually I wouldn't buy Ferrari, but I, mm -hmm. I'd go buy paintings or something. Mm -hmm. But 
in terms of the my day to day life, I really wouldn't be doing that much different. Mm -hmm. You know, it's important to look at yourself and look at the way you spend your time and say, like, you know, like if you're at a job that you think that you enjoy, think like, would I be doing this job if I didn't have to do it for money? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is no, then maybe you shouldn't be doing that job. And if you can, it's not a question that you want to make any like very impulsive decisions off of. Mm -hmm. um, it's a kind of question where it's like, you know, maybe, maybe you think that you're at a job because you really enjoy it, but you're actually there for money. So maybe you should start working towards getting away from that instead of um, staying there and being promoted and committing more of yourself to it, committing more of your time to it um, because you actually don't enjoy it, you know. So, well, you would be doing exactly what you're doing right now, which is what? Uh, traveling, you know, working for Proco. Um, I uh, ride my bike quite a bit. You know, I mm -hmm. hang out with friends. Uh -huh. I draw sometimes. I, I, I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna try and attempt uh, to backpack for a little while. Mm -hmm. The friend that I went with on the bike trip with, his name is Eric Nobajar, and I'm, I'm absolutely butchering his last name. I think. Oh dear. He spent a year in Thailand backpacking around, spending like three between three hundred and five hundred dollars a month on the travel, the food, the accommodations and apparently you can, you know, an apartment in um, Chiang Mai in Thailand costs, you know, $200 a month and a, like a nice apartment as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I would love to be able to do something like that, you know, spend a few months just wandering around, working remotely, getting to see the rest of the world and, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's something that even if I had a billion dollars, I would still sleep in hostels, I would still Really? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I would still try and get street food. I tried to for as cheap as possible. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And uh, again, it, it's like uh, for anybody listening to this podcast, if uh, if you would be listening to this podcast, if you had a billion dollars still, that means you get something out of listening to this that is actually priceless. You know, um, that there's something that you're trying to learn from this that uh, cannot that you feel like you cannot get from from money. You know, um, and I think that that's a that that's the kind of stuff you want more of your more in your life. You know, things that are that are actually priceless. You know, um, and I, I'm not I'm not diminishing the value of doing things for money. You like better I, not be. I, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think it's important to to do that kind of stuff when you need money. Money is not important except when you need it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, when you're hungry and homeless, then you know it's yeah. incredibly important. Um, but you know when you're you know, like, like there's that uh, statistic where I, I think it's it's definitely more now. But when I read it, it was uh, the cap for happiness is like eighty thousand dollars a year. And then after that, there's severe diminishing returns on how much money can affect your actual, you know, your actual happiness. You know, mm -hmm. it's like you 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 can only ride one jet ski at a time. You know, <laughs> like you don't need fifty jet skis or fifty Ferraris or fifty. Uh, nice houses or any of that kind of stuff to be happy. And of course, it depends on where you're living too, whether you're living in New York or Orange County or whether you're living in, in the country. But uh, but yeah, there comes a point where uh, the the pleasures that money will give will not be more comforts or more indulgences. They'll be other, they'll tap into other things, more control, more power, more security, a sense of a security about the future. Uh, yeah, I've thought about that. I've thought about, you know, what is what is uh, your first priority? But to me, it was never to get rich. Yeah. Although now I kind of wish that it had been a bit more of that. <laughs> well, I, I, I think, you know, it's um, if you wanted to be rich, I think you would have been rich, you know. And I, I mean that truthfully. It's like the way you spend your time is a good indication of what you actually truly value. Yeah. You can tell what somebody actually values based on what they do, not what they say. Mm -hmm. Plenty of people can say that they really like you know. Obviously, I want I want more money, but I'm not willing to actually do things to earn a lot more money. Mm -hmm. There's that story of a Martin Shalrecki. I, I don't know if you re remember Martin Sh Shalrecki. No, tell me. I think it was early 2010s. He bought out a company for I think AIDS medication, and he marked it up by like a thousand percent. Oh, I do know who he was. Yes, stuff like that happens all the time, right? You know, he, he's, he's not, a, he's not a, a unique case and he was just the one that was 
butchered for it. Right. He was the public face of what how, how immoral a person could be to get money. If I could earn $100 million right now and do that, I wouldn't do it. Hope not. You know, $100 million would solve a lot of my problems, but not it's not worth it to stoop that low in order to get that income in order to, you know, like, like money's not that valuable to me. You know, I, I think that doing stuff like that is obviously deplorable. I don't think it's good, but I don't necessarily shame him for it because it's something that people do all the time. You know, people sell out their values in order for money, you know, in order to get money. And I, I think, you know, my entire point with this is that there's a price to being rich often that people don't realize, you know. Like if, if you own an iPhone or if you, you know, like Apple takes advantage of uh, work in China that probably isn't that fair to the worker, you know. And um, it, it's often, you know, it, it's worth it to overlook that kind of stuff in order to, you know, have an iPhone or be a little bit wealthier or, or whatever else. And, you know, th th there's a double-edged sword to all of this. Uh, all this maybe stuff. or maybe not. Yeah, this brings up a topic, doesn't it? Yeah, it sure does. Yeah, it, it's, it's uh, quite a deep one that might, uh, I guess, it's polarize some people. It strays from draftsmen. <laughs> it, it sure does, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I guess it's, uh, you know, the, I, I remember I asked you once, it's uh, like, what would you do if you had a billion dollars? And you told me you would do your best work. Yeah, I remember we, we were yeah. with your dad in a restaurant and that was the question. Yeah, uh, Javier is at the Spectrum. Yeah. So. And uh, I asked your, your dad and I asked you and you said you gave the same answer. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's by far the, the most important thing to do, to do. To do our best work is hard too because we don't do our best work. We could always do better and so, it keeps us hoping and moving toward a goal and not just resting, but resting sometimes. Right. Right. Well, and it, I don't know. It, it's like it's, it would be nice to have a billion dollars, but not at the price of not doing your best work. Yeah. Sometimes having money as an end, extrinsic motivator is something that enables you to, you know, to do better work. If you can get the two going together, that I might be able to do my best work and make my money with it. But to answer your question, that's that's like the root of asking those crazy questions. Is that it? It you know generally they're so ridiculous and they're so over the top that people do choose a side, and it does you know people do share some of their values. Yeah. So val value tussling ensues in a safe and jovial forum because of the triviality of peanut butter and coffee compared to politics or religion. Yeah. Well, and in you choosing the million dollars over wanting to deal with all the logistical nightmares of selling hundreds of billions of gallons of coffee, you know, it says yeah. something about like having a million dollars is way easier than doing that. <laughs> well, that's my crazy question for you. Uh, if, you had a uh, if you had a chance to choose to sing one song that would be the greatest song ever sung and would be known as such and it just came out of you spontaneously as if a spirit was singing through you, what song would it be? Um, Weezer comes to mind. Oh, Weezer. Yeah. You, you introduced me to Weezer, right? I am a huge fan of Weezer. Yeah. Uh, Weezer, the Blue Album is the, literally the best album okay. of all time. And, okay. <laughs> um, I, I don't, again, I'm not, I'm not a singer but I wouldn't sing any of their songs publicly but probably My Name is Jonas or, or something like that. Okay. Well, we'll see if Charlie can uh, arrange to have this happen through the magic of, of deep fake. But he might not. Charlie's busy. Charlie's working on a lot of stuff for this holiday season. And wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if we had an opportunity to just talk to Charlie, just to snap our fingers like that? Should we try it? Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. This is an attempt. Ready? Clap. Look who's here with us. Charlie, you may not know this, but we conjured you up. We said, wouldn't it be great if Charlie were here? And we, we snapped our fingers and here you are. Oh my gosh. All right. Wow. How did it happen? What was it like from your experience? I was just suddenly, I felt a tugging sensation. And then I materialized. I could see like the flesh forming over the skeleton and then the, uh, the skin over that, and then clothing finally box. Wow, crazy. Well, what did you, what did you come by here for? Just because we summoned you? <laughs> <laughs> I 
You tell me. Oh, well, we were just hoping to see you because we think so much of you because you are the person who has, people think I'm exaggerating when I say, if anybody gives a compliment to the Draftsman podcast, well, you can thank Charlie for that. They think I'm kidding and they think it's false humility. They do not know that it is not false humility, but that's because they don't know. But you know, and I know, and Christian knows. And so this is our little club. Yeah, yeah. Charlie is a true genius behind the Draftsman podcast. He is. He makes it work when it sucked. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for the compliment fest. <laughs> well, you have anything to tell us about what's going on in your life or anything to share with us? Um, I might rent out uh, a local theater for a birthday party, and uh, <laughs> but I'm going to watch a garbage movie. <laughs> well, well, what garbage movie? Um, Troll 2. Uh, I hear it's funny. Oh, it's it's a riot. It's, I think I see. Yeah, I think some students showed me uh, stuff of it. It's, it's like really campy, scary stuff. Yeah, it's one of the all time greats of it's so bad that it's good movies. It, it has a scene in a kitchen with a family, a dad and kids, or something like that. That I recall. Yes, and the young child's uh, deceased grandpa, who is an all powerful specter for reasons unknown, um, is able to stop time to give them. Uh, a moment to formulate a plan because he can't have his family eat the food that's on the table. And his solution is to stand up on the table and uh, pee on all the food. Grandpa! Don't let them eat, Joshua. For the love of God, don't let them eat. I must do it. I must do it. No, Daddy, please! Do you see this writing? Do you know what it means? Hospitality. And you can't piss on hospitality. I won't allow it! Oh, wow. that's right. Gosh, th this is just, I am so glad we, we had you in here to share this with us. <laughs> Christian, you got anything for Charlie? Yeah, well, yeah, actually I do. I, I, I think, so... I, I, it's more of a, a story that Charlie and I, and I have for you. So while, while I was in Cambridge, Charlie came to visit me. I, I don't know if you knew that. I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there, a couple of blocks from the house I was staying at was the original Green Dragon pub. I'll be doggone. It's where J.R.R. Tolkien came up with the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy. Is this where the Inklings met? I don't know the Inklings. Okay, well, the Inklings were a group of writers, which included Tolkien and Lewis. And, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm familiar okay. with that. Um, yeah, it, it might, might have been. And at the Green Dragon Pub, um, there is a inscription above the fireplace that J.R. Tolkien came up with Lord of the Rings there. And I have a selfie with Charlie at that pub. This is the best ever. Yeah, yeah we it got sure to is. see uh, the walls were misshapen from uh, the passage of time, just yeah, yeah, you know, bulges right. and everything. and. A nice cozy fireplace and yeah, massive too. It's yeah, huge. corners and alcoves and what have you. Yeah, and and it's some very good food as well. That's right at a British pub. That's yeah. where I discovered the joy of oh, what was that dessert called? I can't. Well, I, I think I remember you getting a chocolate ice cream thing. I I can't. It remember. wasn't an ice cream thing. It, it's a caramelized pudding type. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, it was uh, sticky toffee pudding. That's that's great to hear that you all had the Cambridge experience. It yeah, was, it we was biking together. Yeah, yeah. We, we cycled uh, like 20 miles that day or something. Christian got to see how out of shape I am. <laughs> no, no. He, he, well, he, he was on a much smaller bike. So, Proco team camaraderie. It, it, was, it was a highlight of my time in Cambridge having Charlie visit me. I'm glad I was able to do it. Uh, yeah. I really enjoyed it. Um, and it's I'm great surprised being in the you. presence of uh, two people who I very much enjoy working with. Well, hey, this was great. We we now feel like we have tapped into some some special power that we should be able to get anybody by snapping our fingers. And if we got you to start with, who knows where we're going to go? This is just great, Charlie. Thanks for joining us. And we wish you the very best for the holidays and this coming year of 2021 and the rest of your life. I'll yeah, pave yeah, the yeah. path for you, whoever you wish to summon next. I instill you with that power. Thank you. Okay. See ya. Bye, Charlie. Hey, that was fun. Maybe we should see, let's see if we can conjure up some other people. My dear friend, Bruce Mayo. Let's try him. You know Bruce. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, ready? Ready? Bruce Mayo. Bruce. 
Bruce, we, we, we snapped our fingers and we wished for you, and look what's happened. <laughs> Good friends there. How are you? I'm so glad to see you. I am so happy to see you, Bruce. Bruce was one of the most awarded uh, creative directors in Orange County advertising history, and he hired me for like 20 years. And their agencies were always so, so good that when you'd go into one of your agencies, you had like a trash bin that was filled with trophies. Am I recalling this correctly? Yes, you are. Yeah, yeah. He did really, really great advertisements, and he always he hired me, and he paid me as much money as he could pay me. So he is like one of the finest people in the world. And we already, before you showed up, we defined a person who's a jerk is a person who wouldn't like Bruce Mayo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I thanks so, so much. Now, now, Christian, how do you know Bruce? I know Bruce through you. Um, we, uh, we met actually at the uh, anatomy workshop, the post anatomy workshop, and he would come over and we'd watch movies together. We watched the Shep Gordon documentary together, yeah, didn't yeah. we? Yeah, we absolutely did, yeah. And then you, you got me some, you got me into Comic-Con one super hot Friday. Bruce, what are you up to? I was just uh, running around and stuff. I went for a walk down by uh, the beach uh, earlier. Out out to San Clemente Pier and then uh, it's kind of cool and, and uh, clear and smells really fresh, you know, because we had rain and it's been a little windy. So, yeah, I'm just sitting around, just getting a few things done. Well, it's great to see you. I, I, I look forward to the day to where we can get Miguel's again. You can have lunch. It's like six, less than six feet away from each other. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Bruce has treated us to, uh, me and, and Christian, to Miguel's restaurant. And Bruce and I even did commercials and stuff for Miguel's and wrote them together. Hello, I'm Ronaldo, the official spokesperson for Miguel's Restaurant in Corona, a local legend for over 30 years. I wasn't their first choice. The more famous hot sauce was their first choice, but the more famous hot sauce has issues. <laughs> So yeah, he is an important part of my life, and this is an opportunity to introduce him to you. Well, it goes right back to you. Thanks. Hey, good to see you, Christian. Marshall, as always, yeah, we'll talk hey, to you soon. Too. Take care. Yeah. Okay, good seeing you. Thanks for coming by. You bet. Yeah. Uh, hey, how about uh, April Solomon? You know yeah. April, don't okay. you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah let's try April Solomon. Ready? <laughs> okay. There you are. Hi, April. Hi. <laughs> hey, it's good to see you. Good to see you, too. How you been? I love the sweater. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm very happy with it. How about me? Is what I'm wearing okay? Uh, yeah, I would say you're following the cranberry, you know, cranberry sauce. That's yeah. festive. And so that's like a cranberry color. So yeah. How do you know Christian? I had an art uh, wine class uh, in Saddleback like years ago. I can't remember yeah, yeah, what it was. It, it, super coincidentally, we, we met in Lenny Scarola's figure drawing class. In the great Lenny Scarola's class. It's strange. I, I know you independent of Marshall, and you happen to also independently know my brother as well. Yeah. It's uh, a small world, like really. And, and then, yeah, yeah, incredibly small. Yeah. April and I know each other independent of you. So this is like all of this independence coming together to unity. And what's also interesting that kind of ties it all back to how in Christian and I met is that Lenny Scroll told me about you, Marshall, and that's how I reached out to you. And that's how we met. Our lives are intertwined here. This is just exciting. Uh, what have you been doing today, April? Uh, I was actually writing some letters for my Patreons. Uh, I just got nice. a new patron today. So. Wow. Yay. Yay. And uh, so I, I released these stickers that I made for you know, my patrons that decided to join in October. And I was just writing out the letters and drawing little little doodles on the envelopes, and I just shipped them out today. Wow, like handwritten letters. And I got a little drawing on the back. So they all get an original drawing and the stickers inside. That's great. If people go to your Patreon and they're part of your life by way of Patreon, they get original April Solomon artwork? They do. And wow! Awesome. Oh! Yay! <laughs> oh, life is good. It is good. It is pretty awesome. You don't know it, but we kind of, uh, we snapped our fingers hoping for you and, and it happened. It was really exciting for us. Yeah, yeah. We snapped and you were magically there. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to uh, 
a periate, I think is what they yeah, say. Yeah, you were periated. Yeah. 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 So thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank yeah. You guys. Thanks for coming by. See you, yeah. April. Bye. Take care. Nice. Who else would you like to conjure up just to say hi? Uh, Lo- Loic and Leisha. Loic and Leisha. Yeah, yeah. Let's do this. Ready? One, two, three. Hey, look, there's Loic. It worked. Hi, Loic. Happy holidays. Yeah, happy holidays. Happy holidays to you. What are you wearing? I'm wearing a very festive. Nice. You're looking good. And how is your life these days? It's very busy. Loic just had a daughter, actually. I did, I did, yes. A new baby. Really? Yes. I didn't know anything about this. Three months yeah. and 10 days. Three months and 10 days is a baby. <laughs> and how's Leisha? She's good. She's busy as well. Is it possible for her to come in for, for like a, a second? Or She's outside right now. I don't know where she is exactly. She's like uh, outside the house doing some cleaning, I think. Any chance we'd see the baby? Uh, she's sleeping. That's why I'm, I'm able to oh, okay. do this meeting. <laughs> okay. Your life has other priorities than the, the Draftsman podcast. Loic, I haven't seen you since Concept Design Academy attendance days, like two years ago. Yeah, that yeah. was fun. I remember that. A lot of fun. It was an yeah. I like, I like, uh, I like the look of it. It looks like a little warehouse. Very, very artsy. Well, so, so I, I guess to introduce Loic to people that don't know Loic, I met Loic at the Watts Atelier in San Diego. And, yes. uh, We've been we've been friends ever since. That's right. And, uh, and Marshall, you know you know Loic through me because we went to what was it? Um, you were doing a lecture. We were doing the the anatomy workshop in summer 2018, and we went for walks after those lectures. Wasn't it the Chuck Gordon movie? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, you, you were there for that. Yeah, boy, I was there. We've got. Yeah, I think I watched it twice. There. Christian was so so ready to show that to me. Well, this has got to happen on a worldwide scale now. See, see, we did it. We did it as an experiment in Laguna Hills. And now we've got to do this as the whole world gets together and watches things together and talks about them. Now, Loic, do you have any words of wisdom for us? <laughs> I don't know. I need uh, What was the topic you guys were talking about? We were talking about, uh, at one point, the superiority of crunchy peanut butter to smooth peanut butter. So if you have any opinions about that. That's tough because it depends on your teeth. Oh, I, d- I didn't think about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's if you got gaps sense. in your teeth, then you don't want the crunchy, eh? Right, 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 because it gets stuck. Christian, isn't that interesting that, you know, you and I didn't think of that, and this shows the value of community. You bring in someone else who sees that the the teeth are a part of this. That really, this so is... You guys need a, a wider perspective. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Loic. <laughs> yeah. You need someone who was born with a big gap between their teeth. <laughs> oh, can you can you show? Oh, no, I don't have it anymore. I mean, oh, when, yeah. I was, when I was born, I got braces since then. <laughs> And it got fixed. Hey, there's Leisha. Hey. Hi, Leisha. Look at me. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I understand the fatigue of motherhood. Well, say hi to Leisha for us. Okay. Hello, Leisha. She's gone. And bless your baby and your life in every way possible. Thank you so much. See you, Loic. Bye, Loic. Let's try for the biggest dog ever. Who, who do you think that is? Oh, wait, the, the biggest dog in general? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Joe Biden. No, 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 no. I'm talking about in our world. Uh, okay, okay. I'm I'm suggesting, I'm nominating Stan Prokopenko, new oh, father okay. of a baby girl. Right, Maybe that's right. public knowledge now. Maybe it isn't. Charlie will decide. But let's try for Stan. Ready? Nothing's happening. Maybe we didn't snap hard enough. Try again. Okay. No Stan. Okay, well, what do we do? Do you want to do two hands? Yeah, 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 yeah. Just do two, two hands. Okay. Ready? Okay, this isn't working. Maybe we just yeah. need to wait a week. Okay, yeah. That's probably for, probably for the best. I wanted you all to meet Christian, and now you have met Christian, and now you know that he is not only a networker and a connector, uh, but a gatekeeper, and we'll see where things go from here. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Christian. Yeah, absolutely. And if you have any advice on uh, backpacking around Colombia or Thailand, let me know because I would love to hear about it. People know how to connect with you now. Uh, my website is uh, christianne.com. And let's spell it out. Uh, K-R-I-S-T-I-A-N-N-E-E dot C-O-M. Wow, that was very yeah. good. Okay, you have, yeah. uh, you have succeeded I'm a good at, speller. at spelling your own name. Yeah, <laughs> I, I've been learning that for decades. All right, see you again.
Hey, Merry Christmas, everybody. I just want to thank you all for all of your kind messages and support this past year. And I want to wish you and your families and all of your loved ones a very happy, creative, and hopefully a much better new year. I'll see you guys in the year of the ox. Take care. Bye-bye.